When you first started teaching yin yoga, were you already teaching flow, vinyasa, hatha yoga, those styles that might be considered a little bit more yang? And when you began teaching that yin yoga, I'm curious as to whether or not you changed anything about your language or word choicing or pacing, or was it merely teaching, the, teaching in the exact same way, but just simply doing some name changes and a little bit more time in the shapes? Something that I think about a lot is how yin yoga is that complementary other side to flow yoga or yang styles of yoga. And in a sense, they, they do need to be considered as quite different uh, elements of the whole. So my question for you is, do you teach yin in a yang way? When I think about one of the fundamental differences between these styles of yoga, I usually think about each of their relationship to gravity. So if you're in a flow class or just a strong, even like a strong um, Iyengar class or uh, an Ashtanga class, there's this constant sense of using your muscular activation to resist gravity. There's always um, a fair amount of engagement in muscles and contractibility in the body as if you're trying to constantly lift out of the ground up against gravity. Whereas in yin yoga, which can often be a very new kind of felt experience, we are moving with gravity. And the letting go of muscles that are contracted very much helps us to sink into the floor and feel that heaviness and lots of those words that are often used in a yin class to help us drop. Which is why we're not really contracting our muscles. That and the contracting of muscles may be a bit counterintuitive or counterproductive to trying to get into the target areas of the body. So if I'm thinking about yang practices as resisting gravity, a lot of the language is usually very action oriented, pushing and pulling and um, hugging and squeezing and lifting. <laughs> They're all, they all require um, a big effort of sorts. And I think it's totally fine if you are moving into teaching yin yoga and you're still figuring out what changes you want to make. I think it's definitely a process of gently examining things, seeing how they feel as they come out of your mouth, and then beginning to weed and um, swap things out. So if someone's coming out of a shape in a yin yoga class, very action-based words might actually feel like way too much effort. One of the exercises that we do in the yin yoga training that I run it's just a small exercise, it comes up early in the training. I invite everybody to start thinking about language that might be more appropriate for a yin class. So if we're going with gravity and going you know, in that downward grain of gravity, what kind of verbs would be more yin-like versus yang-like? And we just start to write out a list of words or even images that might be a little bit more yin-like. And it's quite stream of consciousness. Often we get words like melt and sink and rest and soft. But if you're a student of yin yoga, you will feel the difference in the invitation of a word, push versus melt. Push yourself up to sitting or gently roll up to sitting. Because the postures are all given totally new names, they've got a completely different way of um, being felt when we do them. It would make no sense if Paschimottanasana was Paschimottanasana for both kinds of yoga. Paschimottanasana and caterpillar. Half pigeon, sleeping swan. So we already have a different kind of neurological connection to what sleeping swan feels like in the body versus half pigeon. Sometimes I come across students who are teaching yin yoga, but they haven't done any training yet. And they are very quickly realizing that they've walked into a different kind of forest. 
the energy is different it's, and, and something about the way that they've been teaching just doesn't feel like it works. The frequency is different. And so things can come up for people. Oh my gosh, I, I, I've realized how much I'm talking because I'm so used to talking in a flow class because I'm giving off all these alignment cues one after the other because there's so much I've got to say or there's so much I think I have to say. And then I come to these yin classes that I'm teaching and there's just all this time and I feel really uncomfortable not talking. But the silences are such an important part of that. I think it is in our favor as yin yoga teachers to really explore how we set up an environment with our language, with our descriptors, with our invitations. Because when you're practicing, it's such a deep, well, potentially it's such a deep internal space that you go to. I can almost feel my brainwaves clicking down into these very quiet, dreamy, low states as opposed to this very alert, very conscious, very active. I've got things I've got to keep doing. It's not like that at all. And so because I'm down in this more dreamy state, time gets very warped. How many times have you heard that? Someone comes out of the class and goes, wow, that hour went so fast. It goes fast for us too as teachers. I think time is a different beast in a yin experience because you kind of drifting in and out of these different brainwave states. And because of that, we as facilitators of that practice are guiding it in a very different way. And if we want to match that energy, I think we really need to examine the kinds of words that we're using, how quickly we're speaking, how much space we allow for, and yeah, bringing in new words. So if you've never done that exercise, it's really helpful. Think about some of the really common things that you might say in a flow class and then find the yin descriptor of that. So I said before, uh, push yourself up out of the floor. And the other example I gave that might be more yin friendly <laughs> is gently roll up to sitting. Because as teachers, we are also creating these scripts. We've got these um, well-versed, um, frequently rehearsed, scripted ways in which we say things. That's just our brain creating uh, verbal programs. Everybody has that. But we can definitely switch into autopilot with that. The yin practice invites us to be really present to what we're saying and hold that space for the students that are there. And if you find yourself just, you know, rattling off the things that you always say, have you slipped into that autopilot mode? Do the things that you say in a flow class really work in a yin class? And if not, take your time to begin letting a new kind of language emerge from you. It's like we've got to develop skills for both. But I think someone that's really tuned into energy and someone that's really tuned into what's going on in that practice will probably intuitively get that anyway. What's that saying? Yeah, don't, <laughs> well, don't exercise yang tissues in a yin way and don't exercise yin tissues in a yang way and we should be creating a fairly safe experience for the body. Maybe it's the same, you know. Keep all of your yang language over in the yang world <laughs> and then bring out the yin language for the yin world and just see how it feels. See what kind of feedback you're getting. <laughs>